Hello everyone, thank you so much for letting me be a part of your class at Kent State University. My name is Amanda Fench and I am a sales manager with Penguin Random House. If you are not familiar with us uh, beyond just the name, we are the world's largest publishing house incorporating over 250 imprints and several clients. Um, we publish bestsellers like John Grisham and Chris Bojalian, as well as lesser known names through houses like Riverhead and Broadway. We also incorporate houses like Del Rey, if you're a fantasy fan like I am, and a whole lot more. Uh, a little background on me, I am indeed a public librarian from Ohio. I have spent my entire career, so the last 12 years, working in various facets in public libraries, most recently the Adult Services Manager at the Westerville Public Library, which is how I know your instructor, Jessica Curtis. Hi, Jessica. Thanks so much for asking me to do this. Uh, Jessica wanted me to do our presentation, our book buzz, um, that we as regional sales managers primarily do for library patrons. A large part of my job is to go out to the public libraries and the territories that I cover, so the state of Ohio and the DC Arlington areas uh, near Virginia, and do these types of presentations. Uh, I also build and maintain relationships with different public libraries, assist them with things like their library comic cons and getting authors in. It's a lot of relationship management, but the best part of the job really is these book buzzes. Um, I do them for audiences. I've had small audiences. You know how it can be with library programming. Um, we get five people show up or we'll get 80 people to show up. There's not a lot of in-between sometimes, but the best part is getting to talk about the books that our library marketing team puts in these presentations. We're always encouraged as uh, field reps to add in our own books. I have stuck to the traditional buzz for this presentation, um, but we do have the freedom to customize them. We also do these for uh, library staff as well during things like in-service days. So I definitely get heavy on the customization for those presentations. So I'll go through this just like I would a typical book buzz and you're going to see how, well, I guess I should say one way of doing a book talk or a book presentation. Um, you guys in your class, you're probably thinking of the different ways that you want to go in your library career, whether you're just starting out or you're well into it and you're going back to get your MLIS. Um, so no matter whether you work with adults, with teens, with kids, I've worked with all three, um, you, can, you can take notes from this. And I hope that it's helpful because I also want you to understand that my way of talking about books, I tend to do fast and furious. I want to get to the good meaty chunks of it um, because you only have so much time, whether you're talking to someone going down the stairs and a patron's caught you and they say, hey, you recommended that book to me. You got another one for me? Or if they're coming to the desk and ask you that question that I know all librarians, I certainly did love and dread, which is, can you recommend a good book? Boy, what am I going to do with that, right? There's lots of ways you can approach that question, and I hope that this presentation is helpful for you that for that for you in that regard. Ooh, try that again. Also, learn to talk. That could be helpful too. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and get started with our borrow, read, repeat book buzz. All right, guys. So one of the first things that we usually talk to patrons about are our newsletters. And if you weren't aware, we have newsletters. Look at that. Uh, borrow, read, repeat. The, that newsletter is a smaller, more encapsulated form of what you're going to see in this presentation. We typically cover mid-list titles, not a lot of the bestsellers. There might be one or two in the presentation, but usually the books that are mid-level that can get be hit or miss as far as people hearing about them. So we do the presentation uh, to help people learn about them and hopefully entice them to read the title. That newsletter, this borrow, read, repeat, does the exact same thing. Uh, it's fun, it's monthly, we're certainly not trying to spam anybody's inboxes, and you get hot takes on titles that we think are going to be a lot of fun. Another thing that I'm sure everyone in the class is familiar with, but what patrons aren't typically familiar with, is library reads. Uh, if you do not know what this is, these are the top 10 uh, e-galleys, typically on Edelweiss. If you don't know what that is, shoot me an email. My email is at the end of the presentation. Um, that librarians can access. They then leave reviews through Edelweiss, and Library Reads compiles the top 10 titles each month. 
and puts them out on a list. And it's a great way, again, look, I mean, these are mostly mid-list titles. I think the Will Schwabe is probably the only one that's hit the best seller so far. And yes, four of these are our titles. The Girl, Bef Girl Before, the uh, top pick there at the top of the screen, The Bear and the Nightingale, books, actually five of them, goodness, Books for Living, The Most Dangerous Place on Earth, and The Fifth Petal. Those are all PRH titles. Our other newsletter that we talk to patrons about quite a bit is our First Look Book Club. This is very similar in format to like what Barnes & Noble does. Uh, you get a chapter a day in your inbox. We'll send you the first, usually three to five chapters of an upcoming mid-list title that we want people to know about. You get to read it and then we entice readers to go ahead and contact their local libraries through online or over the phone and get those titles placed on hold if they're interested. People also get to enter in weekly book giveaways, which is a lot of fun. Couple more here. Something that we started doing back in 2016 was to put together chapter samplers or sets of stories from books that we really wanted people to know about. Uh, we make them free and downloadable online. You can see the tiny URL there for the uh, most recent one, which is Celebrated Stories of 2016. These are the books picked by the folks in library marketing in New York City on Broadway there. Uh, they picked their favorite books of the year and then put them in this sampler. There's a couple of chapters from each of the books in there. On Twitter, hashtag Ask a Librarian. Every Thursday from noon to 1 p.m., librarians, people from publishing, yes, us included, but other publishers as well, and readers from across the globe hop into this hashtag and start talking about books. It is a lot of fun. Uh, if your patrons are looking for a fast and furious book recommendation hour, this is definitely somewhere to point them to. And if they're really interested and they don't know how to work Twitter, you get the bonus of teaching them how to work Twitter because I know that's what you guys do because I did it for about six years. And our last two here, we've got a returning bestsellers slide. Uh, we publish all of these bestsellers and a whole lot more, uh, but we like to let people know, hey, by the way, if you are a Kay Hooper fan, did you know she's got a brand new book coming out? Plus, this, I just like the way this slide's laid out with all of the covers, because you know how it is. The cover usually, or sometimes doesn't, sell the book. And the last one, we always have this in our buzzes as well are books that are recently or will be coming up on the big screen. I am certain the big one on there, beyond Star Wars, I know what it is, everybody knows what it is, uh, is going to be Wonder. I cannot wait to see the reaction to that in theaters on April 7th. And we get started with our book buzz. So first off, we have the new Schwab, Will Schwabe title. Usually at this point, I ask patrons in the room if they read the End of Your Life book club. Shockingly, I thought that book was incredibly popular. With book clubs, it seemed like we were always getting asked for it, but I have rarely had it more than maybe a third of the room say that yes, they read that. Uh, and it's usually <laughs> just a couple, it might be two or three hands. Um, End of Your Life Book Club, if you aren't familiar with the backstory to that, it's the true story of Will and his mother, who was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and their conversation about books. So when she got sick, Will was sitting with her one day while she was getting chemotherapy, and he turned to her and he said, hey mom, what are the what are the books that really impacted you through your life? And they started this conversation and that conversation became the New York Times bestselling book. So with Books for Living, Will is kind of flipping it on its head. His mom is now gone and he has decided to reflect on that exact same question he asked his mother. What are the books that have impacted me over the course of my lifetime. And it's not one of those things where it's a, it's a heavy thinking piece on, oh, this book did that. He's actually going back through his catalog because he's a huge reader of the books that he's looked at and read over his life and how they impacted him. Positive, negative, did he finish it? Did he not finish it? Why didn't he finish it if that was the case? So he's covering everything in here from George Orwell's 1984, Melville's Bartleby the Shrivener, and Lamott's Bird by Bird. Lots of different titles and reasons why he did pick up the book and what he thought about it. And it's really, this is a reader's book. So anybody who loves books, loves reading, thinks libraries are just great, they're going to have a good time with this memoir. 
Oh, The Bear and the Nightingale, one of my favorite books on here. I'm going to nerd out on you guys a little bit. And it's out, so make sure that you pick it up if you get the chance. Uh, Catherine Arden is one of our really strong debut voices. Oh my gosh, this book. So if you like fairy tales and you like things like Neil Gaiman and you like dark stuff, all of that kind of coalesces into this beautiful book, The Bear and the Nightingale. What Catherine Hare is doing is she's retelling the story, the Russian fairy tale, I should say, of Vasilisa the Beautiful. So in The Bear and the Nightingale, we open with Vasilisa sitting around the fire with her siblings as their nurse tells them fairy tales. Tales that they know and love from their village and the surrounding areas, um, stories they may not have heard before. But Vasilisa's favorite is the one about the blue-eyed demon named Frost. And Frost is that guy who if you're in the Russian wilderness and you're caught after dark and you can't find your way home, you may not ever make it there because Frost might pick you up and carry you off. Now it's scary, but Vasilisa likes it. So as life goes on and they're, they're trying to deal with living in this tiny village, um, Vasilisa's mother one day falls ill and then shortly thereafter passes away. Vasilisa's father, who is just bereft at this point, runs off to Moscow, they think, to help bolster the family business. And he comes back with a brand new wife. And thus we have our evil stepmother in the fairy tale. But don't let me convince you that on the surface that's all that there is. There's a lot more involved in this book because the stepmother has now decided to get rid of Vasilisa. Vasilisa's of marrying age. Stepmother doesn't want her there anymore. She can get this problematic child out of the house because Vasilisa is insisting against the stepmother's wishes that the kids continue to honor the gods and the folk tales and the rituals of their people in their village. And the stepmother, who is a devout Christian, does not want this to happen. So there's a, a battle of wills going on. And just as Vasilisa is getting ready to uh, get the boot out of her home and the village is having to deal with this rogue preacher who's coming around and telling them that they're all horrible people because of their traditions. Um, everything happens all at once. The crops start dying, villagers start going missing, and the village is in dire straits at this point. And Vasilisa realizes that all of this has happened because they stopped uh, obeying the rituals and honoring their gods and Frost, that demon out of the stories that she loved so much, has actually come to visit their village and she's the only one who knows how to stop him. It's a great book, oh my gosh, it's fantastic. One of our few New York Times bestselling authors in here, Chris Bojalian, um, with The Sleepwalker, he's telling a slightly different kind of story than what he's actually typically known for, I should say. Um, Bojalian has a very strong social commentary running through a lot of his books, and he tells, he tells individual stories, which I think people really appreciate. There aren't series going on, you don't have any catching up to do. But with The Sleepwalker, he is encapsulating a murder mystery with the strange kind of gray dreamy area of a woman who sleepwalks, hence the title. So Anna Lee is the woman, the sleepwalker in this case, and she has two daughters. And the daughters know that if mom starts kind of banging around in the middle of the night, they better go check on her because they found her in some weird spots. They have found mom on the edge of a bridge one night and she was convinced she needed to jump. They have found her in front of the house trying to trim the giant bushes with huge pair of gardening shears while doing this in her nightgown and completely oblivious to the fact that it was the middle of the night. So one night when Annalise starts making noise, the daughters jump up and go to look for her and Annalise has gone. They cannot find her anywhere. And there's, there's no trace. There's absolutely nothing that they can do. So they call the police. The search parties go out, the dogs go out, the young detective in charge of the case is fretting over the family, he wants to make sure everybody's okay, dad comes back into town from business and finds out all of this has happened, and the oldest daughter noticed something, and she was <sighs> reluctant to say anything, I, should, I really should say, because she never really connected the dots until now when mom's gone, which is mom only sleepwalks when dad's out of town. 
She tells the young detective this. The detective starts looking into the father. Months go by. Mom is still missing. And then one day, they get a clue. The only clue in this case. Because up till this point, they were ready to, to declare her dead. They find a scrap of a nightshirt that matches the description of the one the mother was wearing the night she disappeared. And it opens the case again. And the oldest daughter is kind of taking charge. She's having to keep the family together. She's having to get her younger sister off to school. All of this is happening. And that young detective I mentioned earlier, see this is when things get really weird because just as there's hope that mom will be found, even if mom is found dead, at least they'll have closure. The oldest daughter is seeing him around the house. She's seeing him down the street. He's knocking on doors, on their door at weird times. He's checking in on them. He's asking really personal questions and she's starting to get weirded out. She at first suspected her father, and now she's wondering if this young detective, who was so doe-eyed and ready to help them, maybe isn't behind her mother's disappearance. The Most Dangerous Place on Earth by Lindsay Lee Johnson. Uh, this is another debut novel. We have really strong debut voices in this lineup. I love it. Uh, and it is indeed about the most dangerous place on earth, at least to all of us who have lived through it. It's a book about high school. So in this, we follow five high schoolers who all attend the same wealthy private school in Northern California. And I actually have to look at my notes for this one because I always get their names mixed up. So the five of them, I'll go through them real quick. Abigail is the Ivy League kid, right? She is going to go to the best school. She has the ridiculous GPA. She has that list of things that she is checking off methodically as she goes through her years in high school because she is going to be so successful. I'm pretty sure this kid probably doesn't sneeze without asking somebody's permission. I mean, that's how rigid she is on everything and, and to her path to success. And she makes one very bad decision. <laughs> she decides to get involved with one of her teachers. Davis, the kid who's supposed to be Ivy League, but, and his parents want him to be an Ivy League student, Dave knows he's a B student at best, and he's okay with that, but the tremendous pressure from his parents is really starting to drag him down. He's depressed, his grades are slipping, He's not sure what the point of all of it is, and he is trying to find a way to cope with the pressure, and it's probably not the most healthy thing in the world. Emma is a, an incredibly gifted dancer. She is dealing with rehearsals, friends, and homework during the week, and then on the weekends, copes with all of that pressure by getting blackout drunk. Damon is the quote-unquote rehab kid, right? He got addicted, he went to rehab, he's come back, and everyone knows that Damon is a loser. He's a washout, it's never going to amount to anything, but he's determined to prove everybody wrong. And then finally we have Callista, who was essentially part of the mean girl clique, but has come back one day, um, dressed as a hippie and basically smelling like patchouli, and no one knows why, but something rather tantamount has shifted in her personality and everyone's very kind of freaked out by this. In the middle of this whirlwind of these kids, you've got Molly and Molly is the young English teacher who's just gonna by gum pull these kids together. She has no idea what she has stepped into here. Burning Bright by Nicholas Petrie. Uh, this is the second book in the Peter Ash series. The first book is called The Drifter. This is a fantastic pick for anybody who is a fan of Jack Reacher, loves Jason Bourne, spy thrillers, all of that. Um, but his his style reminds me of something a little more, don't get me wrong, with Lee Child and, and Robert Crace, but it's a little more, uh, less on the, I should say, less on the gritty and more on the, the fluid in his writing. It's it's a lot of fun to, to read his stuff. And Peter is a, a fun character as well. Peter is a war veteran with severe PTSD. And after the events of the first book, he has decided to go back to his roots. He's going to go back to hiking and nature, and he decides to take a trip out to the Redwood Forests of California. And he's out there one morning, and he kind of forgot how thick the fog can get and he's down on the forest floor and he's blinded by the fog and he turns a corner 
it's I would call it a wrong corner because he turns around and there's a bear. There aren't supposed to be bears in the Redwoods, guys, which he automatically realizes is wrong and strange. And he is like, okay, you know what? I'm going to climb a tree because I can't punch a bear. I mean, he could try, but he'd get eaten. And he climbs the tree. So I love describing this book because it's that madcap kind of spy thriller plot you are expecting. Uh, and at the same time, he throws some curveballs your way. Because now while Peter's sitting in this tree waiting for the bear to go off and do his bear things, he looks up and he realizes someone else has climbed the tree before him, at least because they've left a rope behind. And he's thinking, well, that's strange, but sure. And decides to follow the rope up because maybe someone left a, a blind or something up there that he could, he could sit on that would be more comfortable than a branch. And he gets up to the top of the rope and there on a platform suspended is a woman. She's sitting there. She's shivering. She's scared to death. And he is completely confounded by this. So as they talk, once she calms down, uh, he hears her story and her name is June. June is an investigative journalist whose most recent case was looking into the mysterious death of her own mother. Her mother had worked for a high-tech firm who had had a bunch of government contracts and June knows two things. Her mother was murdered, absolutely certain her mother was murdered and her mom was murdered because of the tech she was working on and thus starts this breakneck pace thriller peter and june trying to dodge men and guns and shadowy military para organizations and all of this is going on while they try to solve the murder and stay out of the hands of the people who probably killed june's mom and want this tech all to themselves all right, lucky boy. Um, this is an intertwining story about two women, the bond of motherhood, and a little boy whose nickname is Nacho, which could be cuter if it tried. And this is the type of story, it's very emotional. It's, there are no bad guys in this story. It's not meant to be, it really is about these two women. So at the start of it, we have uh, Kavya. She is the quote, as she would call herself, not so good daughter of uh, Indian immigrants. And she calls herself the not so good daughter because she's always disappointed them. She didn't go to the schools that they wanted her to. They married, she married the guy that they didn't want. And now she can't even give them a grandkid because they, she and her husband are having trouble conceiving. And she's just disappointment after disappointment. And she's kind of embodied this role now. And so she feels less of a person because she can't have a baby. So her and her husband decide to get on the foster list. And hopefully something will come their way that could maybe lead into adoption. And they can have the family that they want. On the other side of the story, we have Soli, and Soli is an undocumented Mexican immigrant who is determined to start a new life in America. She crosses the border with her boyfriend, and she is very pregnant at this time. He strands her. He runs off, leaves her alone in a brand new country. She's ready to give birth at any moment, and she doesn't know what she's going to do. She takes a job cleaning houses. She has her little boy. His name is Ignacio. It's where the nacho comes from. And she's just trying to eke out a life for her and Ignacio. Um, a while later, she is involved in an accident. The police are called, and then the police realize she is undocumented. She is put into uh, police custody, and Ignacio is taken away from her. And he is, you probably guessed it, placed then with Kavya and her husband. So now we have this struggle going on over this little boy between two women who truly love him, the mother and the foster mother. And it's about how they reconcile their lives and their love for this child and how they go about um, trying to, to maybe even make a family between the bunch of them so that Ignacio doesn't have to choose between parents. The Fifth Petal by Brunonia Berry. Um, if you happen to read her first book, The Lace Reader, you will recognize the same setting in The Fifth Petal. It is modern day Salem. You do not need to read The Lace Reader, however, in order to understand The Fifth Petal, which is helpful. Um, the other main tie back to The Lace Reader is that the uh, chief of police, John, uh, is married to The Lace Reader from the first book. So there's your other tie. 
and this is a suspense and mystery thriller and it starts with the mysterious death of a teenage boy on Halloween night in Salem, Massachusetts. So you can cue the creepy music <laughs> if you want to. It was a lot of fun to book talk this during Halloween for certain. Um, and he is trying to puzzle this out because it's it's a small town and they don't see a lot of crime and they definitely don't see a lot of murders. And he's just trying to figure out what's going on. And the more he digs into the case, the more he realizes that this death, this mysterious potential murder is linked back to the town's most infamous case, a triple homicide on Halloween night back in 1989, dubbed the Goddess Murders. Three women found dead in the same location, roughly, all dressed in white. And he's thrown by this, but he, the evidence points him there, so he starts following the trail. He is confronted by a young woman named Kaylee. Kaylee is actually the daughter of one of those women killed in 1989. And she says, I've been investigating my mom's death. I'm convinced it was a murder. And I think the murder of this young boy is also connected. And he's like, I have found my partner. So they go off together to try to figure out what's going on. And as they dig, they realize that all of the evidence points to the one person in town. There's no way this woman did this. It's the town historian. That's that's like saying the librarian did it. It's just, it makes no sense. This woman is a keystone of of the way Salem is drawn up. It's just, it, it makes no sense to any of them, but all of the evidence points there. So they're trying to find anyone else who might have done this. Uh, and the town is starting now to get wind that the evidence points to this local historian. So it's a murder mystery. It's slightly supernatural because there's some stuff going on in the background that you know, you have to puzzle out along with John and Kaylee, and they have to confront might, what might be a, a dangerous supernatural force as the actual murderer. The Girl Before, this is one of the creepiest books uh, that has <laughs> passed through my hands in recent memory. Um, I hope you like your nightmares because, <laughs> oh, yeah, this book, if you like psychological terrifying thrillers you will adore this book uh, it is another debut novel jp delaney is a pseudonym for another writer i believe it's a screenwriter i'm not sure who the name actually is um but with the girl before jp delaney is telling the story of two women and a house called one Folgate street so we'll start with emma's story emma is reeling from having her house broken into while she was home she does not want to live in that apartment anymore, but she's having trouble finding a new place to live because everything is either too far away from her work, it's too expensive, it doesn't meet her needs, and she's not sure what she's going to do. And she runs across an ad for One Fullgate Street. Now, this is a house that is owned by the man who built it. He's, it's owned by the architect, and it is known through town. It is a house of beautiful glass and stone and it's a it's a marvel it's a wonder everyone knows the architects he's kind of a weird guy but he's never hurt anybody he's just he's kind of a hermit and keeps to himself and he doesn't really live there so she's really surprised when she sees it up for rent it's her last place to investigate or she doesn't know what she's going to do so she goes to one full gate street she meets the owner it's strange but he's artistic maybe that's linked together and it's a price she can afford, so she decides to stay there. Right before she moves in, the owner emails her and says, hey, do me a favor. I want you to make a list of every possession you consider essential to your life, and then don't bring it into my house. You're going to ruin the flow. You're going to ruin the chi of the house. I don't want a bunch of your personal stuff hanging around. It's weird, but she does it. Okay. We then move on to Jane. Jane is in a similar situation. She's reeling from a personal tragedy. She needs to start over again. And here is an ad for One Fulgate Street. Same kind of encounter with the owner. Uh, he's weird, but this place is gorgeous and she can afford it. And yeah, that email saying, hey, don't bring your, your crap into my house, essentially, is also weird, but it's her last chance. What's she going to do? In that house, Jane makes the same decisions meets the same people, and finds the same terror that the girl before did. 
Ugh, it's creepy. Okay, <laughs> we'll move on. Oh my gosh. All right, for more of a domestic uh, thriller that doesn't so much have the psychological end of it, another strong debut voice. Uh, my Husband's Wife by Jane Corey was actually originally published in England, and then we brought it over here through Penguin. And it starts off with the story of Lily and Ed, and they are newly married after a whirlwind romance. They get married really fast. And Lily has just passed the bar, so she's going to start her life as a defense attorney. Ed manages a small advertising firm, and he wants to be an artist, so he's always he's spending his free time sketching. And they are so happy, you guys, that, like, oh, gross kind of happy. <laughs> and they like their neighborhood. They like their neighbors. They're one set of neighbors. They have a daughter named Carla. She's a little too old for a babysitter, but not really old enough to stay on her own. And the parents go out of town a lot on the weekends, and they ask Lily and Ed if they can just kind of keep an eye on Carla. So they've become kind of de facto uh, babysitters for this nine-year-old girl. And life is great. So Lily takes her first defense case, and it is the appeal of a man in prison. And his name is Joe. And she goes to meet Joe for the first time, sits down across from him, and it is completely stunned. Joe looks exactly like her dead brother, Daniel. It's uncanny. It's, it could be Daniel sitting right across from her, and she's, she's stunned by this. Anybody would be. But she's a professional. She's going to plow through and... Um, <coughs> pardon me, help build Joe's case. And the more they get to know each other, she finds she actually really likes this guy. She can't picture him having done the crime that he was uh, prosecuted and then put in jail for. And she's not paying attention because Joe is getting creepy. Joe is asking very personal questions and starting to kind of worm his way into her life and by, uh, by default, her husband's life as well. All of this is going on. They're watching Carla. Ed is keeping secrets, which Jane is, or um, Lily is also not paying attention to. And she has no idea that Ed proposed to her so quickly for a very certain reason. All of this is happening. And then years later, Lily opens the door when her doorbell rings and there stands Carla, 15 years older. She's now 24 years old. And Carla is asking for Lily's help because it's the only place she had to turn. And she says, I need your help. It has to do with your husband. All right, Home Sweet Home by April Smith. This is a combination of historical and political thriller. Um, it is a fascinating story about a family and it starts in the 1950s. So in the 50s, we have the Cusack family. We have Calvin and his wife Betsy and their two kids. Calvin has come back from World War II, a much lauded hero. They live in New York City, but after the war and everything that's happened, they really want to go back to their roots. So they move out to a ranch in South Dakota, um, small town. It's what they both grew up with. Betsy has some uh, nursing training from the war, so she helps patch farmers up their bumps and bruises and injuries they get while on the job. And Calvin decides that he is going to try and give back, and he goes into state assembly. He's young, he's good looking, he's super popular with everybody, and he serves three very popular consecutive terms. I mean, there's almost no question when he goes up for re-election that he's going to get that seat. So after the third term, he reevaluates. The kids are starting to grow up. They're really learning how to help around the ranch and raise the horses and the cattle. And he says, okay, I'm going to go for Senate. He goes to Senate to run for that seat. When you do that, that's the point when the FBI starts nosing around in your background. And it's not Calvin that's the problem. It turns out his wife, Betsy, unbeknownst to him, had had a, uh, we'll call it a dalliance, with the Communist Party when she was younger. Now this is set in the 1950s during McCarthyism, the Red Scare, and you can see where this is going. And as soon as that news hits, the town instantly turns on them. It is everybody against the Cusacks. They are commie lovers. They are going to ruin everybody. They threaten their lives. They threaten their kids. And they, you know, they threaten to set their house on fire. It's just, it's just awful. 
Calvin and his family try to fight back, but the police won't answer their calls. None of this is going anywhere good. And they finally have to go to civil court to sue for libel. And that's great, and they win, but the damage is long done. When we jump 30 years ahead, Calvin's son has now decided uh, to run for office. And Lance, who's, that's the son, and his wife and their child are found brutally murdered in their home. And the police dig into the family's history and they realize that Lance's murder has to be connected to the ruined reputation of the Cusacks some 30 years earlier. All right, Sarah Jo has a new book out, uh, perfect for fans of contemporary women's fiction and romantic fiction. Uh, this is, will be an excellent book for uh, book clubs that enjoy that kind of thing. I always think of my book club friends because goodness knows I've seen a lot of them over the course of my career. And in Always, Sarah is telling us the story of uh, Kaylee and, well, it's Kaylee. She has a fiance. His name's Ryan and they are happy. They are going to get married. They live in Seattle. They have a wonderful downtown apartment. Their careers are on track. And Kaylee feels settled. Like for the first time in her life, everything isn't going at a million miles a minute. And she finally is content with her life and her place in the world. So they're at dinner one night. She can't eat all her food. She takes it in a to-go bag. And they're walking down the street hand in hand. And there is a homeless man sitting on the sidewalk begging for a change or whatever people are willing to give him. And she thinks, well, my food is still hot. I will give it to him. At least he can eat something. And she bends down to give it to him. And he looks up at her and she realizes she knows this man. She doesn't just know this man. She was madly in love with him about 10 years ago. His name is Cade and she cannot fathom what he's doing, sitting on the sidewalk, homeless, begging for change. What, he was so driven and successful and just wanted the world at his feet 10 years ago. What happened? So without telling her fiance, Ryan, Kaylee decides to help Cade get back up on his feet because while their relationship ended poorly, I mean, he didn't just break her heart. He ripped her to pieces when he left. She can put all that aside now. Her life is settled. His is not. And she feels like the world has just been unfair to him. So she tries to get him back up on his feet. He's having memory problems. Something has happened to him in those 10 years. And he's having some, some difficulties with amnesia. So she tries to help him piece together his past. And ultimately, pardon me, in the process of all of this, she realizes that, yeah, she still loves this guy. So now she has to decide what she's going to do. Does she stay on this path and keep helping Cade and realize that she's falling further and further back in love with him? Or does she abandon that ship and go back to Ryan where her life is safe and secure, but she may never know what will happen with Cade? All Are Wrong Todays by Elon Masti. Debut novel. If you read nothing else out of this presentation, I hope you pick this book up. Now, if you are not a science fiction fan or a fan of time travel stories, please don't let that dissuade you from this book. It is, that is, it's a plot point. It, it moves the story further along. It's not the central storyline to all our wrong todays. So we have Tom, and this is first person narration, which I'm not typically a fan of. I ripped through this book at light speed because it's just so good. Um, Tom lives in 2016, but he lives in a version of 2016 that is not ours. It's essentially, if you're familiar with it, the multiverse theory. So his version of 2016 is perfection. They have flying cars and moon bases and everything is perfect. His avocados don't rot, it's a true point in the book. And everyone is content, it is utopia. They need nothing, they want for nothing. And his family and his friends are always so freaking happy and Tom is not. Tom is unsettled. He feels like he should fit in here but he's always felt like an outsider and he's never been sure why. He makes a decision and it's a it's a fun sciency kind of black hole physics issue that pops up and he gets launched into our 2016. Now, 
Tom is not going to make this comparison because he wouldn't know what it was. <laughs> I'll do it for him. He thinks he's landed in Mad Max. Everything is awful. It is weird here and terrible and people are upset and they're apparently angry because this thing called punk rock exists. Like he just does not get any of this. Oh, and his avocado shot too. The, just, the world has just gone crazy. He doesn't get it. But this isn't a back to the future kind of thing where you, you jump timelines and you actually can erase yourself if you make the wrong decisions. No, all of his friends, his family are here. The girl he loved in the, his version of reality and that he kind of lost a chance with, she's here too. Everybody's here. And they have their moments, right? They have happy moments and sad moments and they lose people and there's grief and there's anger. But he realizes as he sticks around and, and gets to know this version of his family and his friends, these people are happier and far more content. They are leading fuller, richer lives than those paper doll versions of the people that he loves. And he has to decide, essentially, do I, do I stay? Do I go? What do I, what fate do I give myself because I have this power and, and how should I be using it? It is a fantastic book. We Were the Lucky Ones by Georgia Hunter, another very strong debut. It is a fictionalized version of what actually happened to Georgia's family. So when Georgia was 15, and this is all the true part of the story, I encourage you to go to her website because she documents all of this. When she was 15, she was talking to her family and they were telling her stories about how her family escaped from Poland right before the Nazis invaded, uh, before World War II. So her family, their um, surname was the, I gotta look at my notes really quick, um, oh, oh, the Kirks, sorry about that, the Kirks. And they fled Poland and her grandmother has all of these scrapbooks full of the family trees and any records that she could get her hands on. And Georgia became fascinated and she decided that she wanted to pull up as much of her family's history as she could. So she has spent the last couple of decades digging and getting every bit of information possible. So if you've got patrons who love genealogy, and I know that every library does, this is a fantastic book to give them because her website documents all the work that she did. And all of that work culminated in this book. So it tells the story of her, her grandmother and grandfather, what happened to their siblings as they were running, as they were leaving Poland, they got split up. They were supposed to meet at a designated place and a couple of them didn't make it and they feared them dead. Of course they did. They actually wound up scattered all across the globe. It is a perfect book club pick. It is a perfect pick for fans of historical fiction. Um, and it's a fascinating family story because you've got one sibling who's forced into exile, another one who has to try and leave the entire continent. Others of them are just trying to dodge um, Nazi troops and they're trying, they're working grueling hours with no food and little pay. Um, some of them are hiding as genteels right in plain sight. Others are condemned to the ghettos. And it's all driven by, the story is driven by this will that all of the siblings will eventually be reunited, but it takes decades for them to find each other again. Gilded Cage is the one, I would say like pure fantasy book in here. And I love that we have a genre book uh, with this. Vic James is a well-known British screenwriter. So she is bringing her screenwriting prowess to the publishing world with this novel. And it is a fascinating take on what most would consider to be British fantasy. So when you say that, I think a lot of the pictures that we have in our minds, at least for most people, are the type of fantasy that's uh, more Victorian, right? It's set back during those times. It's This isn't. It looks like it might be, but it's actually set in, in modern day times. And I, I tell people this book is about magic in the time of iPhones and the internet and what happens. So we have two classes of people in Gilded Cage. We have the equals. They are the most powerful families in England. They control the economy, politics, religion, all of it. They are the magic wielders. They are few and far between. 
It's a little, you can make the comparison to pure bloods and Harry Potter kind of that way. Um, there's always a chance that babies born into these families won't have any magic, and that is the case with the most powerful family, the Jardines. They have a son, a middle son, who has no magical ability whatsoever. Um, but then the other end of this, the other side of this tale, are the people who don't have magic. It's the masses, right? And how does magic and the people who wield it, how does that dictate the entire uh, the entire landscape of Britain. Well, it happens like this. So if you don't have magic, you have to. Doesn't matter what point in your life, but you have to before you die. Serve the equals for 10 years. Now, most people usually wait until they're older, until they've retired. Um, some of them get it over really fast. They right out of college into that, and then they can move on with the rest of their lives. But you have to serve the equals. Uh, Luke and Abigail's family, Luke is the oldest son, Abigail is the middle daughter, and then they have a younger sister. Luke is getting ready to go off to university, his life ahead of him, his parents have said, you can decide when you go do your service, and then his parents changed their minds, and they said, you know what, none of us have done our, our service, our 10 years, we're going to do it together, and Luke's like, I cannot believe you just did that to me, I'm getting ready to start my life, and you just signed me up involuntarily for 10 years, because he was just under that of age, limit and so he's stuck. Uh, Abigail is very clever though and manages to get them all slightly more cushy assignments serving that Jardine family, the one that I mentioned has, they're at the top of the equal food chain. Um, but last minute Luke gets reassigned. He gets reassigned to the work town of Millmore. It's a manufacturing town and he soon finds out uh, just how rough life can be there. But he meets a young woman who she kind of blips in and out really fast and he, he's not sure if she actually is a magic user or if she's just lived there for a long time and that is the case. She was born in Millmore, her parents are long dead, and she has decided to help people out by stealing medicine and food and supplies from the authorities and giving it to the people who are worse off, to the very poor, the very sick. And she's working in tandem with one of the doctors in town and Luke gets involved with them and he's kind of he's, he's Robin Hooding kind of about halfway through the book and he starts hearing whispers the more and more he gets involved he starts hearing the whisper of revolution revolution we're going to take back our society from the equals on the other end of this Abigail and her younger sister are trying to puzzle out the Jardine family because there's something weird going on with the youngest son he's a young teenager He's very odd. And they find him one day killing a tree and bringing it back to life with a flick of his hand with his magic. This is magic no one's ever seen before. And they're very wary of him because he's kind of creepy. Um, but the more they get to know him, the more they realize that he wants nothing to do with his family or the equals or any of this. He has his own goals in mind and he might just be the key to kickstart that revolution. All right, the Chilberry Ladies Choir. This is another debut novel. Jennifer Ryan is writing a book set just over a handful of months in 1940. And I'll actually read you this a uh, couple of lines here from it because I think it sums up the book really well. Just because the men have gone to war, why do we have to close the choir? And precisely when we need it the most. So at the heart of this, you have Rose, who is the new music teacher in town, and she comes in to Chilbury and sees that the choir has been shut down by the stuffy old pastor who says, all the men have gone to war. It was a co-ed choir, so you guys have to wait. You women have to wait until the men come back, and they're all aghast. I mean, the choir was the only thing really bolstering them, and they need this choir right now. So Rose kind of <laughs> goes rogue, which I love this, and decides that they're going to make their own lady squire. And so you follow this cast of characters through a handful of months. You've got um, the young Jewish woman who's just trying to hide and, and stay under the radar. You have the town beauty who's drawn to the artist in, in town. Um, the, wit, the young widow who uh, long ago lost her husband and now her oldest son is right on the front lines and she's terrified she's going to lose him. All of these characters and a lot more going on in the middle of this little town and they're just trying to stay alive and stay hopeful and hopefully see the end of World War II. 
All right, uh, for Lincoln in the Bardo, this is George Saunders' new book. Uh, if you are not familiar with Saunders, his short story collection, 10th of December, was a National Book Award finalist. Um, for people who have been waiting for this novel, they've been waiting a long time, and people are thrilled. I will explain the title as we go. You know, there's that saying that there are no new stories, only um, new takes on old ones. I have never heard this plot line before. And if you're like me, and you probably are, you're a heavy reader. So this, this plot line just blew my mind when I read about it. So from a seed of historical truth, George wields a, kind of a tale of what that space is between life and death. So in February of 1862, and this is the part that's all true, Civil War is less than a year old. The fighting has started in earnest, and the entire country has kind of realized that there's probably no short end to what will be a long and bloody war. And at the same time, President Lincoln's beloved 11-year-old son, Willie, is lying in the White House, ill, and the doctors, despite the fact that Willie looks like he's on death's door, the doctor's saying, oh, he'll come around, he'll come around. Well, he doesn't. Willie dies at 11 years old. And Lincoln is bereft. He doesn't know what he's going to do. He goes back to Willie's uh, crypt several times just to hold his son's body. And from that little bit of truth, we then get the story of what's happened to Willie. Willie is stuck in Bardo. It is, uh, it's called that in the tr Tibetan tradition. It's basically limbo. He's stuck between life and death. And he is surrounded by the long dead souls, the souls that have passed over uh, to the other side. And they're all wondering who this little boy is because he doesn't, he doesn't act or look like any of them. And it starts this monumental struggle over Willie's soul. It is a fascinatingly imaginative book. You've got um, kind of daring writing coupled with Willie's fascination and terror at what's going on, this chorus of dead souls who are talking, you've got different personalities there, and it really talks, I would say that the strongest part of this book is how it deals with the question of how do we live and love when we know that everything we love is going to die? Uh, the perfect pick for anybody you know, a young person who wants to do charity or philanthropic work, Girl Rising um, by Tanya Lee Stone is based off of the documentary with the same name. And in it, she covers the documentary process. She covers the young women who are um, introduced to us in the documentary. And it starts with a fact, which is, Worldwide, over 62 million girls are not in school. So she is looking at the different barriers to education. She talks about the problems that these young women uh, come across later in their lives and the difficulties that they face because it can be something as simple as they don't have the education so they can't start their own business all the way up to far more worse things, early childhood marriage and childbearing, um, slavery, sexual trafficking, gender discrimination, poverty. And she goes through the process of saying, if we remove the barriers to education, these things, they're never going to disappear, but these young women are going to have a far better chance at living safer, healthier, more prosperous lives. And as they do that, they then build up their community so it benefits everybody. It's a really compelling narrative. Um, you've got full color photos from the film, you have infographics, and it really is the perfect book I would give to any teen who wants to try to find a way to help better the world. Setting Free the Kites, this is a really neat coming of age story that to me had splashes of Stand By Me in it um, because it is about the friendship between two young men. Um, we've got Robert and then we have Nathan. So Robert is the kid who is always picked on. He doesn't want to go back to school. He doesn't want to start eighth grade because he knows he's going to get shoved in the locker. 
uh, and this is set originally back in 1976 so it's those metal like horrible lockers and he he just doesn't want to go he knows it's going to be bad and on that first day of school he is saved from his bullies by the new kid Nathan and they become fast friends and it isn't just because Nathan saved Robert from his bullies but it also has a lot to do with the fact that they are very different than each other but they both have this, this kind of thirst for adventure Nathan is bold and daring and way too confident for an eighth grader. He just, he knows he's going to run the world someday. And he has kind of a kooky dad, but Robert really likes Nathan's dad. And um, Nathan and Nathan's father show Robert uh, their different hobbies, which include flying kites. So there we have a little bit of the title. Um, Nathan's father really likes to get up on the roof of their house and try to catch the wind up there with kites. And so Robert and Nathan one day run home from school and they go over to Nathan's house because Nathan's dad said, hey, I'm going to take you out for ice cream when you get home. And they get home and they find out that Nathan's father has fallen from the roof and broken his neck and died. So now we have a personal tragedy in the lives of these two young men and Nathan has to cope with losing his father so suddenly in such a freak accident. Robert is trying to help his friend um, and they deal with that tragedy over the course of the school year. And then when summer starts, leading into their ninth grade year, Robert says, Nathan, you're coming with me. My dad runs that really crappy uh, carnival on the end of town, and you're going to come with me and work there. And no one goes there because it's so horrible, and dad wants to sell it. But I bet we can eat all of the junk food and stare at girls, so yay, that's a good thing. So they go, you know, like ninth grade boys would and they spend the summer dealing with Nathan's lingering grief over the loss of his dad um, that family is kind of falling apart so Robert's trying to help and then Robert is also coming to grips with the fact that his older brother Liam who suffers from a form of muscular dystrophy is just withering before his eyes and Liam eventually does before the end of the summer pass away so now you have another uh, storyline of grief and how Robert deals with that and how Nathan bolsters him and it's it's an endearing story about heartbreak and loss but also how friendship can pull you through that I See You is another wonderfully creepy psychological thriller uh, from the author of I Let You Go, which was a library reads pick uh, when that came out. So yay. Uh, this is the story of what privacy actually means and how easy it is to have our information <laughs> swiped and how easy it is for us to see our entire lives crumble kind of before our eyes. So Zoe Walker is like a lot of commuters. She takes the same path to work. She gets, this is set in England, so she's actually on the train. She gets on the same train every day, sits in the same car, and it's really her only moment of quiet. She has two teenagers and she's a single mom and her house is chaotic. She just really likes her commute, <laughs> even though it's long, she really likes it. So on her way back home one day, she picks up the paper and she's sitting on the train and she's flipping through the classified ads and she looks down and her face is like milk carton style staring back up at her. There's nothing beneath the picture except a phone number and the website findtheone.com and she freaks out like any of us would. Takes the paper home, shows her kids, oh my gosh, what is going on? Why is this? And the kids are going, we should look at the website. She's, no, don't do that. Don't look at the website. And they're trying to calm her down. And no, mom, that's not really, that's a really bad picture. You're way prettier than that. And no, and so he calms down and says, okay, maybe it's not me. She does the same thing the next day. On the way home, looks at the paper, bam, another woman's face. Same style, same phone number, same website right below it. And she's like, nope, okay, you know what? No, I was right. This is not good. Takes the paper to the police and shows uh, the detective who picks up the case. And the detective, she's funny because she's trying to deal with coming back on the job after being suspended because she got in trouble for punching a pedophile, which I do believe any of us would do. Um, and so she needs a case to redeem her in the eyes of the commander. And she takes Zoe's case and together they run to try and figure out what's going on because these women who keep popping up in the paper, they're disappearing. And it gets to the point where Zoe is the only one 
who hasn't gone mysteriously missing. All right, the Roanoke girls, this is a really tense family drama that I think will freak anybody out, but it will also make you question if you know your relatives <laughs> well enough, like you should. Um, Roanoke girls, they, they don't last long. In the end, they either run or they die. So after her mother's suicide, uh, Lane Roanoke, who is 15 years old when the book starts, she comes to live with her grandparents and her kind of fireball cousin, Allegra, on this vast estate in rural Kentucky. Now, Lane had, hadn't had any contact with these people before. Her mother kept her as far away from the rest of the family as possible. And Lane never really questioned it, but now she's living with people who are strangers and dealing with the loss of her mom. And she is getting catered to because her grandparents are rich. She had no idea. And she gets to know them and she's thinking, why did mom keep me away from them? These people are, they're great. They're giving me everything I want. And it's, it's everything, it's everything a 15 year old girl could imagine. But that little bit of suspicion in the back of Lane's head is bothering her. She's thinking, why did mom keep me away? from these people. So as her bond with her cousin, her younger cousin, Allegra grows, Lane starts digging into the family history, going through anything she can possibly find when her grandparents aren't looking. And she figures out a secret. And it is one of those dark VC Andrews style secrets. And Lane, who is now getting ready to graduate high school, runs. She runs so fast and so far away and she leaves everybody, including Allegra, behind. Eleven years later, Lane is in Los Angeles and she is kind of adrift. Her life has not come together the way that she was hoping. Um, she's tried to give herself several fresh starts, nothing's taken, and she gets a call from her grandfather who has tracked her down and her grandfather says, please, I know that you ran. I don't know why. I know you don't like us, but for the sake of Allegra, please come back and help us. She's gone missing. We don't know what's happened to her, and you guys have been close even after you left. Maybe maybe you can help. So Lane goes back, fearful of what she's going to find, and she realizes that Allegra, she didn't just run. She may have actually uncovered that same family secret, the one Lane probably should have told her about before she took off for LA and Lane worries that that secret might have gotten Allegra killed. The Stranger in the Woods is a fascinating true story of the man known as the North Pond Hermit. So Michael Finkel, who is a true, true crime writer and an investigative journalist, um, one day is looking through the online news and he comes across the story of a man named Christopher Knight. Police have arrested this man for burglary, but when they started talking to him further, they realized that this man had been living alone in the wilderness of Maine for 27 years. And Michael, being the investigative journalist that he is, latched onto that and said, I've got to talk to this guy. So he goes out to Maine and he wants to discover why, why, why would you do this? What made you go out into the woods and just never really come back to civilization? So he sits down with Christopher and Christopher starts telling his story. Um, Christopher had been a very uh, simple, he'd loved a simple life. He was not extraordinary in any way, shape or form as a kid pretty quiet, but um, he, and he didn't like being by himself, but I mean, that's, uh, there are kids like that all the time. And one day when he was 20, he suddenly quit his job and without saying a word to anybody, friends or family, or even acquaintances, anyone, he got on a road trip that led him to the shores of Moosehead Lake in Maine. He parked his car, carried a backpack, of supplies and a tent out into the woods and disappeared off the face of the planet. And he'd been living in those woods ever since, 27 years later. He's now telling the story. So Christopher talks to him. He asks, or I should say Michael talks to Christopher. He asks him why and gets into the meat of, of why Christopher did this. Um, 
Michael also gets the chance to talk to some of the folks who own the cottages around the lake because they started to realize their stuff was going missing. Christopher was actually stealing just to survive. He never was breaking in to hurt anybody. He tried to break in when there was no one there, but he was he was taking food and, and small supplies. And they were scared at first, but the owners slowly got to know Christopher and eventually started putting supplies just outside their doors for him, whatever they could um, they were willing to part with, they would put it out there with a little note for him, and Christopher came to rely on um, the kindness of strangers, essentially. So all of this is wrapped up in this really cool, true story. Um, it's a narrative I feel like would be good for Bill Bryson fans, um, and it's a it really takes a good look at the nature of the relationship between an individual and society as a whole, and looks at the meaning of happiness and fulfillment in a world that's so busy with the internet and iPhones and everything else. Celine is an incredibly, incredibly charming book. Um, I could see this book going off really well with lots of readers. I instantly thought of anybody who's a fan of Agatha Christie, Miss Marple, because we have kind of a, I hate that it would be called this, but you know it would, which would be an unconventional heroine. Um, she's unconventional because she's older, oh my gosh. But uh, this is, it's Selim. So she is not your typical private eye. She is in her mid 60s. She is wealthy and she is wholly interested in detective work that, that helps to reunite families. Those are the only cases she will take. Half of the fun of this story is Celine and her running narrative and her relationship with her husband, Pete, who is kind of her unofficial partner. He helps her run the business on the side and they are, they are so cute together. Oh my goodness, because they've been married for a long time and Pete supports her fully. It's wonderful. And Celine one day has a young woman walk into her office and this young woman's name is Gabriella and Gabriella asks for Celine's help in finding her father. She says, my dad uh, was a photographer and he went missing on the border of Montana and Wyoming. And by the way, he went missing 23 years ago and everyone is telling me he's long dead or if he's not dead, he's never coming back. And I just, I don't believe that. I've got to know what happened to him. So Celine picks up the case and she follows it out. She and Pete, load up the trailer, their, um, their son's camper, which is another cute little factor, and they go out to Yellowstone. The records say that uh, it was assumed that Gabriella's dad died of a grizzly ma uh, mauling, but his body was never found. So how can you say that a grizzly did that if there's no body? And that obviously has Celine's PI radar up and running. Uh, and as they drive out to Yellowstone, they realize a couple of things. They're being followed. And it's probably by a person who doesn't want this case reopened. What follows is a really clever literary thriller that is manages to be both charming and intelligent. Um, like I mentioned, Celine is a lot of fun. Pete is a lot of fun. And you also get uh, Peter Heller's strong suit in this book. He is known as a nature writer. And so the descriptions of Yellowstone and the stars at night and the park are just fantastically done. The book that will make you cry because you're laughing so hard, it's this one. Uh, the Book of Polly by Kathy Heppenstall. Polly, for me, is essentially Sophia from the Golden Girls if she were Southern, a chain smoker, and a heavy drinker. Like that, that sass, that wit, all there in Polly. And that picture on the front, the woman with the spade and the pink suit and the hunting falcon on her shoulder, that's Polly. Oh my goodness gracious. It is one of the most hilarious family stories I've ever come across. Uh, Polly is definitely unconventional. She is 68 years old. She loves to chain smoke and drink while planting flowers and vegetables in her garden. And she has lots of secrets in her past. She is not like the other moms in town. Polly has a 10 year old daughter named Willow. Yep, Polly had Willow when she was 58 years old. A miracle, Polly calls it. Willow's dad is long gone. 
it's just Polly and Willow, and Willow, as she's growing up, knows that her mom is just, she is one of a kind. That Polly, like, my goodness. And as Willow is growing up and going to school and getting older and then becoming a teenager, she recognizes that the things that she took as just her mom, she's getting embarrassed by because mom comes to, like, teacher meetings with a hunting falcon. Mom comes in crazy clothes. She doesn't put the pack of cigarettes down for anything, even though Willow's begged her. But Willow loves her mom. It's the only person in the world she has. So they get on like a bunch of cats fighting, but Willow knows that Polly will never, ever leave her. And then she hears about the bear. The bear is something Polly has always referred to, but never really elaborated on. And as Willow gets older and goes into high school, Polly comes to her one day and says, honey, I think I have the bear. The bear is cancer and it runs in their family pretty heavily. And now Willow is realizing that her mom, her crazy, indestructible, chain smoking, heavy drinking mother might succumb to the most banal of things and she might actually lose Polly. Our final book on here is our newest Tidal Wave pick. Um, we are promoting this book really heavily right now. So if you get a chance to read it, please do and let us know what you think about it. Uh, the Twelve Lives of Samuel Hawley by Hannah Tinty. This is her follow-up after the wild success of The Good Thief. And with Book of Polly, we had a mother-daughter story. The Twelve Lives is a father-daughter story. Um, I think there are a lot of readers for this book. If you like con artist stories, if you like family stories, we don't get a lot of father-daughter uh, novels. So if you like anything like that, you are really going to get a kick out of The Twelve Lives of Samuel Hawley. Um, we follow Samuel and his daughter Lou as the chapters kind of flip back and forth between present day and past. So Lou, who Samuel has been raising on the road, after Lily died, mysteriously Lily being Samuel's wife, um, and Lou has spent a lot of her childhood helping her dad, but never really getting involved in his business. And Samuel's business is thievery. He is an art and jewelry thief, and he fences those things off to the highest bidder. And Lou kind of understands what her dad does, but at the same time, he keeps her so far distanced from it that a lot of times she's just sitting in motel rooms waiting for him to come back. And they have to live in motels because they're constantly on the road, moving from place to place to place. Um, so she starts digging around in her dad's stuff and comes across a bunch of mementos from Lily, her mother. And she's always had pictures of Lily, but these are more personal little pieces of jewelry and other mementos. And she, she wants to know where her mom was. I mean, her dad will talk about Lily, but only to an extent. And as Lou grows older, she realizes she really wants to find out who her mom was. Well, it turns out that Samuel has decided, as Lou is getting older, that the road is really no place for this girl anymore. And he's, he's going to have to settle down. He probably should make a proper citizen out of himself. And he winds up moving back to Lily's hometown in Massachusetts. And... Lou is trying to reconcile this change in her father and his demeanor with trying to unravel her family history. And while becoming curious about her mom, she's also become very curious about her dad and the 12 bullet scars that he carries on his body. So as we get the present day chapters of Lou and Samuel, some of the other chapters flip back and we actually get to hear those 12 stories of the 12 bullet holes and the 12 lives of Samuel Hawley. All right, guys, that is it for me. I appreciate you hanging around. This ran a little bit longer, but I, with some audiences, I tend to elaborate a little bit more on my books. Um, my email address is right there. It's afench at penguinrandomhouse.com. If you've got questions, if you want to sign up for my librarian newsletters that I send out twice a month, if there's anything that I can do for you, please let me know. And I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this slideshow.